It's truly a pleasure to be here at the Woolley and Wallace Auction House, and of course, surrounded by such a distinguished audience. Now, I hope that you've had a chance to explore the remarkable treasures of Derek Parker and Peter Morris next door. It's, as you can see, a very personal collection of beautiful pieces that decorated their homes across the globe. So this evening, we're going to delve into the esteemed brand of Colfax and Fowler, and of course, the aspirational world of country house decoration in honor of Derek and Peter. So to also begin this, I thought that I'd give you a little bit of a background as to why I'm up here speaking to you all tonight. And of course, we're going to admire a few of the key pieces from the exquisite collection available for the sale next week at this, of course, esteemed auction house. So to introduce you to my background, I started Charlotte Stewart Interiors on the back of a career in fashion, accessory designs. And then later on, I went on to become a color consultant working as one of Farrow and Board's lead colorists. Other talks that I have done have also included four Colfax and Fowler to launch some of their collections at Design Week. And in conjunction with this, I've also spoken for House and Garden in collaboration with Julian Chichester. And this was really about investing in key pieces to build your collection and become heirlooms. And in addition to this, of course, I did speak many times for Farrow and Ball at their events on how to put colour together in the home. So it's actually been over a decade now that I've worked on interior design projects of all sizes, from Georgian, from Georgian manor houses to modern new builds. And what drives me in my everyday work is the enormous pleasure I'm afforded to be able to work with such brands as Colfax and Fowler, because they produce the exquisite and timeless designs. So color and pattern are familiar to me as the day is long, and I'm enormously fortunate to have been able to make this my job. Every client and every project is unique, and I could take great satisfaction in bringing out the very best in my clients' homes. So now I was delighted to be able to speak to you tonight because these subjects are very close to my heart both personally and professionally. Imogen Taylor, well, she was John Fowler's PA for 25 years before going on to run Colfax and Fowler for a further 25 years. And she, I'm very lucky to say, is a dear friend of mine who has been as influential as a mentor throughout my career as an interior designer. Now, at the very young age of 97 years old, let me tell you, we have been in constant communication about the talk tonight. And although, sadly, she cannot be with us here in person, she has been incredibly generous in sharing her fascinating stories. Now, a book has been written about her life, and not all of the stories were included. And I am going to share with you some of these tonight, later in the talk. I always love and adore and simply cherish the time talking to Imogen about her life and her career, as she shares many insights into what my industry was like during her age. And of course, I share how it is now. And together, sometimes, occasionally, we roll our eyes. Now, in addition to this, I was born in Melbourne, Australia. And like these distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Parker and Mr. Morris, the city holds a dear place in my heart. It is a wish that all the proceeds from the auction will be contributed to the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, a testament to their enduring legacy. So let us go on to set the scene for our conversation tonight. And it's only right that we should really begin by looking at the history of Colfax and Fowler. So the story of Colfax and Fowler begins with Lady Sybil Colfax, who established the business in the midst of societal norms where typically women of her ilk didn't really engage in professional work. However, it was due to her husband's financial difficulties from the 1930s Wall Street crash that she found herself in need of a job befitting for her social standing. Embracing this new reality, Lady Colfax found herself compelled to take on the role of interior decorator to her well-heeled society contemporaries. Now, venturing into this new domain, Lydia's Lady Sybil Colfax blended comfort with style, attracting influential clients from royalty to entertainers, all connected, of course, through her extensive network. 
And notably, it's said that she maintained a friendship, or perhaps as we know it, an acquaintance with Mrs. Wallace Simpson. And this is something that I'm going to come back to later in the talk, because I'm going to share with you a very personal story conveyed to me firsthand by Imogen. So Lady Colfax was groundbreaking in recognising and subsequently inviting the rising star of interior decorating, Mr John Fowler. And this was to join her at her business in Bruton Street, which was based in Mayfair. Now, John Fowler was actually known for his unique eye in colour and, of course, his expertise in painted finishes. He'd previously worked at Peter Jones on Sloan Square, but it's not as we know the business today. It was very different back then. And John Fowler was quickly becoming renowned for his ability to bring glamour to his clients' spaces. And this was by reworking traditional ideas. He earned the title Prince of Decorators and, of course, went on to attract his very own high-profile clientele. And so, in 1939... Sybil Colfax and John Fowler created Colfax and Fowler. And now we move to the 1940s. Well, this was a business that was born from the post-war era, and this brought forth unique challenges and, of course, modest budgets. So despite the illustrious list of clientele and the grandeur of fine country houses, the aftermath of the war continued to dictate a restrained approach. Residents of these grand estates, although asset rich with inherited furniture, land and artworks, they really did face a financial conundrum because they were cash poor. Full redecoration became a formidable challenge, but it was John Fowler who ingeniously repurposed existing pieces to feel fresh and new. Now, this practice was really ahead of its time and it added a layer of sustainability and creativity and of course, as well as enriching the already ex exquisite tapestry of their designs. He famously considered himself a haute couture decorator, but in truth, his work was the very definition of simple, humble elegance. So for example, during the rationing and years after the war, only nurses uniform, um, dress cotton, was, and parachute, leftover parachute silk, were available off coupon. Now, the parachute silk was dyed and hung as curtains, <coughs> and the nurse's uniform cotton came in either a blue, a green, or a mauve, or beige stripe. And as Imogen had told me, they used this strong cotton to create loose covers for sofas and chairs. And so began one of the most famous and timeless reflections of country house style, because as we know today, it is indeed the ticking stripe. Now, I didn't know whether or not to mention this in the talk, but it is important in the landscape of where we are going with the history of this. But at this point, financially, Colfax and Fowler were not making any money. They were only covering their costs. However, the partnership between Sybil Colfax and John Fowler went from strength to strength in reputation. And in 1944, the headquarters moved to 39 Brook Street, and this was a place that once belonged to the renowned architect Sir Geoffrey Whitefull. Now, it was really Fowler's flair and scholarly eye that contributed significantly to the company's success, with noteworthy conversation projects such as Clandon Park and Up Park House and Up Park House under his belt. And the 1950s. Well, fast forward a decade and Lady Sybil had retired. And in 1948, a new force entered the scene acquiring the business, Nancy Lancaster. And the Colfax legacy would continue to thrive and expand under this new leadership. She was an American heiress married to a British man. And Nancy Lancaster had great taste herself and she knew how to take the business forward. Her social connections brought a grand new era for the company. And in 1957, she and John Fowler found themselves decorating the iconic yellow room at 39 Brook Street, a groundbreaking space that became a beacon of inspiration in English interior decoration history. And it continues to be a source of inspiration to this day. 
So to set the scene of the famous yellow room at 39 Brook Street, I'm going to share with you the story that Imogen told me recently. Nancy Lancaster had been invited to the very famous Charles de Bestigui Ball in Venice. And naturally, such a glamorous occasion needed much thought and attention to one's wardrobe. Nancy invited the ladies from her office into her drawing room to admire her outfit, glittering in her tiara, her enormous emeralds, and her ball gown by Ceparelli. Imogen described it as saying, it was a thrill for us mere mortals. And she said she looked quite something with her auburn hair and her very upright stance. Riding side saddles seemed to have made her very straight in her walking. Simply no slouching. Now, I believe that Nancy had the most wonderful time at the ball between the socialising and the dancing, and she took the time to admire the Murano chandeliers. Charles de Bestigui put her in touch with the Murano glass to create electric copies of the lights, combining real candles in an old candelabra style. Now, these were the, were the very famous yellow room that John Fowler had designed. And he persuaded Nancy to paint the grandly scaled room with its barrel vaulted ceiling, a startling, luminous, glossy yellow to lift it from its gloomier, shadier tones. Now, numerous coats of paint were stippled to the walls. And it's not as we know it today where you would simply open a can of paint. Paint was hand mixed and this was Imogen being sent out to the chemist, to the hardware store, wherever she could find the ingredients. And John would spend hours and hours upon finding the perfect shade. And this could take days, weeks or months. And then there were layers and layers and layers of glaze applied. And this created a deep gloss that shimmered with the light. In Possible to replicate, as Imo said to me. Now the windows, well, they were dressed with a very theatrical flair. From gilt poles, unlined yellow silk taffeta dress curtains, hung, decorated with taffeta bows, festoons of yellow cord, and lots of large tassels. And inside were thicker yellow curtains, and these were drawn at night for practical reasons. So double mirrors surround doors stood tall at either end of the 46 foot room. And at the very far end, hid a tiny little serving kitchen space. Now I was very lucky to visit Brook Street before the property was sold. And this kitchen was still there. And the yellow drawing room was absolutely beautiful. But there was something quite charming about this kitchen that I sort of thought I liked slightly more in that way. But this is where Nancy's cook, Beryl, sent up the courses in the lift to be served by Flo, her lady's maid. And Imogen described Nancy's food as absolutely delicious. Well, curious to know what they ate. I asked and she said, nursery food, off on coquette, eggs done in double cream with a dash of truffle and always eaten with a silver spoon. <laughs> Slightly more sophisticated than nursery food, I told Imogen. And she said, well, that was Nancy. Everything elevated with a twist. So the room was very cleverly designed to accommodate everything from Nancy's working life with a secretary, Miss Hill. And she sat in the recess of the window at her desk. And there was entertaining, relaxing, or socializing. And this really shows how the, ro the yellow drawing room demonstrates the cleverness of this space because it combined everything so effortlessly and it felt so smooth in transition. Always comfortable, practical and welcoming. Now Nancy herself as a decorator was fearless and experimental. And she would try to fade and wear out the fabrics to create that ever so comfortable lived in feeling. And this would entail her instructing for the sofas and upholsteries to be dragged into the full sunlight to be ravished. And then, in addition to this, dipping all the fabrics in tea for that all important aged look. <laughs> Nancy helped lay the foundations of how we live today. So for example, the idea of the side table next to your sofa was actually hers. Because indeed, it's a practical solution in a decorated room was where to place one's drink. It always has to be at a reachable distance. 
Now, Nancy was the money, and she also bought her list of clients. And although her and John Fowler, it was said they had a strained relationship at times. And even so, it was often sort of referred to, and this remark was made by Lady Astor. They were indeed the most unhappy, unmarried couple in England. <laughs> However, together, they were influential in the 20th century in creating a universal interior design language that is still inspiring to this day. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that for many years I had worked at Farrah and Ball, the leading luxury paint company, and one of the top selling paint colours was a grey called Elephant's Breath. Now, Nancy was actually the one who originally coined the name because when she walked into the room, recently decorated by John, and as I explained to you earlier, that this was all done by hand and mixed and took many, many hours, she walked in and thinking it resembled the most unpleasant colour of the imagined breath of an elephant, she loudly decreed it so, and forevermore the name stuck, becoming probably, arguably, one of the most famous paint colours ever made. Now, Nancy Lancaster and John Fowler's partnership endured over two decades, marked by their complementary tastes and talents. Their collaboration opened further doors to prestigious decoration projects for Chequers and Buckingham Palace. And now to Imogen. Well, Imogen Taylor started work at Brook Street on the 31st of October 1949, helping John Fowler to restore furniture. It was her father who found her the job, and she worked hard, earning the princely sum of £2.10 for a five-and-a-half-day week, working six months before a one-week holiday was permitted. Now, it was not long before John Fowler soon took a keen interest in her skills and Imogen was moved to the front of the house. And this was really where her role was to answer minor requests from clients in search of either a roll of wallpaper or perhaps a chintz to cover a chair. Anything more elaborate would go to John as he really was the main decorator at that time. And of course, she told me that glamorous ladies would come into Brook Street wearing the latest Dior look, beautiful full skirts, nipped in waist, hats, and of course, gloves. Now, it wasn't long before John was calling on her to assist with his project and take notes. And during those meetings, Imogen was instructed never to sit down. For eight years, she stood to intention until finally, one day, John relented when a new secretary was employed. The new employee went into his room, sat down, and he dictated a letter to her. And in Imogen's words, rather badly. But once the secretary had left the room, he turned to Imogen and said, Did you see that girl? She sat down. And Imogen's reply was simply, I do not think it's possible to do shorthand standing up. And he responded with, uh, well, I suppose you better sit in future too. And relaying this back to me recently, as she did, she commented, that sort of thing couldn't happen these days. So things must have got better for us girls. <laughs> Dukes, duchesses, lords and ladies, and the highest of society often swept through the doors at 39 Brook Street. And in particular, Imogen recalls the Duke and Duchess of Windsor coming to see John Fowler for advice on decorating their dining room at their country house, Moulin de la Tuilerie, a gift in Paris. Now, Imogen escorted Wallace Simpson up the sweeping staircase. The Duke, following behind her, bounded two stairs at a time like a schoolboy. Wallace turned to him and in a scornful voice said, we don't need you, David. Lost, the Duke simply replied. Well, what should I do? Oh, why don't you go and buy yourself some brushes at the end of Bond Street? And of course she was referring to Asprey's. And like that, he was dismissed from <coughs> duty. Now, I'm a very visual person, and I had to ask the all-important questions to Imogen of, well, what does she wear? 
And what was she like? And she told me that she was dressed top to toe in a black suit that only accentuated her slenderness. No hat, but an eye-watering large diamond brooch on her lapel. And despite her well-mannered demeanour and appearance, Imogen said she was not pretty. A hard marble face that reminded her of a snake, and her voice was even more harsh, and I really wish that my American accent was as good as hers. And in Imogen's own words, no charm noticeably at that moment, and particularly to her husband. Now, John designed the dining room for them. He hand-painted the Duchess a toile, something he had never done before for anyone else. And it was a coarse painted canvas hung in panels depicting a scene of bulrushes in pale greys and greens. <coughs> now, to complete the look, John persuaded the Duchess to use a rush matting on the floor. He told her of the apple growers Waveney Rush, a business at Suffolk, that when they were not busy picking fruit, they wove rush mats from the reeds grown down by the river. The Duchess was open to the idea and thought of it as rustic and amusing. The apple growers started the matting business as a sideline, and today we know it as sizal. It's one of the many examples that highlight how initiative and resourceful Mr Fowler was. No one else at that time had used it. And of course, today, sizal is probably one of the most popular flooring choices as a country house style. Now, once the room was fully decorated, John and Nancy were invited to join the Duke and Duchess for lunch in their dining room. Imogen asked John on his return from France how it went. And he replied, The Duke could not sit still was up and down pacing and most anxious throughout lunch. Despite a lavish feast of several courses, the Duke only ate peas. <laughs> and to quote Mr Fowler, he was not on a diet. And then the 1960s. Well, this ushered in a new era under the leadership of Tom Parr, a business savvy figure, and Tom's combination of acumen and decorating experience set Colfax and Fowler on a new trajectory. And at last, they were in profit and they were earning money. Now, with John Fowler's retirement in 1971, Tom Parr initi initiated a diversification into the retailing of fabrics and wallpapers. The 1970s saw the opening of the chint shop on Nebu Street, marking the introduction of Colfax and Fowler's first off-the-shelf fabric collection. And as we are all here today, it's worth noting that Colfax and Fowler celebrate their 90th year as a brand, and it still remains as influential as ever. The interior design branch of the business, Sybil Colfax and John Fowler Antiques, are still decorating to this day, and they're based in Pimlico. The retailing branch, Colfax and Fowler, have the license to print the retail classic patterns of wallpaper, fabrics and trimmings that have become so iconic today. And they are based on the Fulham Road or the Chelsea Harbour in London. So, which patterns are synonymous with Colfax and Fowler? And of course, which one of these best represent the country house <coughs> decoration as we know it today? So many of the classic Colfax and Fowler prints were actually from the original patterns found in period homes that John Fowler had decorated. And I'm going to have to leap off at this stage and just point them out. So I hope my mic's going to come on. <coughs> Thank you. So as you can see here, this is Bowood. And this is a classic Colfax and Fowler design. And this was based on a document originally discovered by John Fowler at Bowood House. And then down here, although it's difficult to see, this is actually Berkeley Sprig. And this is really based on a fragment of a very early block print wallpaper that was discovered behind layers and layers of other wallpapers that John had found in a property he was decorating in Berkeley Square, Mayfair. And Fuchsia. Well, this is another one of their classic prints, and it comes in many colorways. And this happens to be one of Imogen's favorites. And she has this in her house, 
and I have this in my design studio. And then we come to Honeysuckle Trail, and this was really based on a document from the 1840s as an original design by John Fowler. And then, of course, we've got gingham checks that are iconic, and of course, we go on to look at seaweed squiggle. And this is also a very long standing favourite of Colfax. Now, here, this is actually Snow Tree. And there is a great story that Nancy, um, I want you to go back to the Charles de Bestie Ball, where she is dressed in all her finery her Chaparelli ball gown, her glittering diamonds, emeralds, tiara. And she has been invited to meet with the King of Sweden. And she's so excited about this, and she's in her full outfit, ready to be welcomed, greeted, possibly curtsy. And she's there waiting for him to arrive. And the King of Sweden arrives in shorts, a polo t-shirt, and espadrilles, because he's just come off the beach. <laughs> but what was so lovely, that they obviously struck up this very lovely friendship, because she very much admired this panel, as it was then, of Snow Tree, and the King of Sweden kindly gifted it to her, and then it was taken back to Brook Street and George Oakes. He then made it into the iconic wallpaper that is still printed today. So what is country house style and how is it still relevant today? Well, today country house style incorporates a wide spectrum of design elements. Sustainability and authenticity are key, with old items adding characters to our modern new builds. And I wanted to share, I've got the right slide here. This is a project that I've been recently working on. And as you can see, the colours are slightly changed because colour changes on every screen. So I'd just like to make sure that it's known that it's not quite as bright as it seems in these pictures. But the reason why I wanted to talk about this project was because the client had original Colfax and Fowler wallpaper that had been kept for probably about 40 years. And we discovered this. They moved house, and they had four and a half rolls left. And literally, I was falling over myself at this point with excitement, because to me, this was real gold. This is proper treasure. I mean, this was the most beautiful wallpaper. It was like it was hand-painted. And so I kind of gently, I'd like to say, persuaded the client that this was the way forward because this is actually just a walk through space. And I really wanted to create something that was warm, interesting, and obviously welcoming as well. And therefore, I hope that you'll agree with me, what could have just been a walkthrough actually became something quite decorative as this wallpaper on the background. And then, as you can see, this was originally the room and it felt a bit lacklustre. So as a reference point, of course, thinking of the iconic yellow room, even though I didn't use yellow in this colour of this room, this drawing room, I knew that I needed to bring a certain energy to the space. And that's why I lifted it, by using this sort of blue that sort of did, it didn't sort of shine with the light, but it definitely had movement to it. Um, but equally, I just want to stress it's not quite as bright as it looked there. So, Colfax and Fowler are really known for their muted tones and their versatility. And I have worked on all kinds of properties to deliver this aesthetic. And of course, it's always their fabrics, the wallpapers and the trimmings that I start with as a reference point. And then moving on, this is another project. And I wanted to illustrate here that, again, unfortunately, these clients didn't have the wallpaper hidden away as the gem. But we used another Colfax design, and it's called Swedish Tree. And again, this was originally the start of the property. And as you can see, it was probably decorated in the 1960s and 70s. And it felt quite dark, gloomy, and cold. And really, I wanted to bring it back to life. And therefore, I wanted that warmth, and I wanted it to feel authentic to the property. And therefore, this design was absolutely perfect for it. And also, I'd like to point out that I don't always use yellow in all my halls. It's just that it happened to be that these were just the right projects to talk about tonight. 
Now, other elements that are reflective of country house style include sisal and chintz and stripes, and these were all introduced to us by John Fowler. Window treatments are a key aspect of their decoration style, as well as being li well lined and heat efficient from a practical perspective. Decorative paint finishes such as marbling and malachite have actually become, once again, back in vogue. And it's always about a palette of soft colours, warm colours and indeed a complementary white that help in a way to give these spaces um, that country house feel. Now as designers, we think about comfort of the room and it's not just all about the style. And this really is also what country house decoration is all about. It's about that armchair in the bathroom. It's the well-lined curtains. It's the practical designs as well as the decorative. It's that lived-in look where storytelling plays a role through inherited possessions or acquired antiques. And at the core of this style is a loved and looked after ethos, which cannot be more relevant than today. So what are the great examples of country house decoration and where can they be seen? Well, as we know, National Trust properties across the UK continue to be a source of inspiration to us. And Indrigen told me recently about Radbourne Hall, an 18th century Georgian country house that is one of the few UK landed estates that has passed on only by inheritance and marriage since the Norman conquest in the 11th century. It's also one of the last remaining houses restored and decorated by John Fowler. And Imogen was personally involved in this project in the 1950s, and she was taken back to see it a few years ago. And it also appears in this year's April's edition of House and Garden. So how do you implement country house style if you don't necessarily live in a country house and more of a modern property? Well, I would definitely say it's all about adding architecture. It's that cornice. Perhaps it's a braid that follows the skirting board around the door. It's using muted colours and make sure that it's got enough pitch in it and that will help to soften those spaces and it gives it a feeling of authenticity. And combine these colours with off-whites instead of stark whites. It's okay to have the old and new together. The modern kitchen with the old farmhouse table we want to keep it relevant. It doesn't have to be roses. It can be a, a jug of cowslip on your breakfast table. The look is all about being less polished and more natural. We don't want to live in museums. We want to live practically. And it's the creating the feeling of style. Now, sometimes it's great to have modern and old together because they create those layers and they tell the story. Warm neutrals, brown furniture and beloved sofas where the dogs sleep are desirable and a resurgence of the style is arguably perhaps the result of all of our needs to stay at home during the pandemic. It's okay not to be so polished and creativity is both necessary and enjoyable. Like John Fowler and Nancy Lancaster, now we follow once again the sustainable route by repurposing and buying secondhand to be creative again. Thanks to social media and the digital world, where we can see people in real time achieving this, it's become fashionable again to create something from nothing. So despite its relaxed lived-in aesthetic, country house decoration is actually probably one of the hardest styles to get right. Simple elegance, like John Fowler had decorated, was about layering patterns and colours and sourcing antiques that sit well together. For some, a quite a terrifying prospect. But in truth, it's important that it's about comfort and style and creating spaces that feel inviting, yet timeless. Country house decoration, with its mix of antiques and storytelling and specialist finish, remains classic yet adaptable. And it's about creating the rooms that are loved and lived in, reflecting the evolving nature of design and personal taste. And here we come to Derek Parker and Peter Morris. Well, as friends and long-standing clients of William Wallace, 
Derek and Peter were passionate collectors and antique dealers, and of course, they were also interior decorators. Together, they forged a partnership in 1959, both personally and professionally, to decorate some of the greatest houses, including designing cushions for Holyrood House in Scotland for Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. This led Derek and Peter to open a London showroom at 90 Mound Street in Mayfair. So it wasn't actually far from where Lady Sybil Colfax first started the business. And like her, they also went on and were quite well connected, leading them to work on designs for such as Winston Churchill's bachelor pad that was also in Mayfair. Now at the time, they were dubbed the best dressed men in Mayfair. They lived a glamorous life around the world, including Monte Carlo, owning an apartment beneath Shirley Bassey and driving around in their famous pale blue Rolls Royce. I so would have loved to have been their friend. <laughs> now, when Derek and Peter bought and moved to Netherhampton House, they made sure it was decorated, as they said, to quote them, in pure John Fowler style. Derek told Vogue Living magazine in 1990, I seek to create a comfortable lived-in interior, appropriate to the style of house. Interiors are governed greatly by what people own as to what they aspire. How houses should, after all, be an expression to one's personality and lifestyle. And I think that this says everything about what I've been speaking about tonight. So many of the pieces in the sale are actually from the Netherhampton house. Now, highlights of the collection today include some of the super stylish John Fowler pieces, including, of course, the table made for Nancy Lancaster, which graced the yellow room in Brook Street in the dining part of the area. And this was specially painted for her in the Colfax studio, which was actually based in the basement. And also included are a beautiful pair of painted ribbon mirrors and, of course, the famous Battersea candlesticks, which were a firm favourite of John Fowler's. And I also have it on good authority from Imogen that these are very rare. Other highlights include a Robin marble grand tour bust, originally from Mentmore, and a wonderful large bronze model of a recumbent greyhound or whippet. You'll have to forgive me because my dog breed is knowledge is not up there. But it's truly a wonderful sale. And FYI, my paddle is going to be working overtime to bid next week. So I look forward to seeing as many of you there at the sale. So in conclusion, tonight's auction is not just an opportunity to acquire some exquisite pieces from Derek and Peter's collection. It's a journey through the rich tapestry of their lives and the timeless influence of Colfax and Fowler. So before we open the floor to any questions, if you'd like to come and speak to me afterwards about any interior design projects, I'd be happy to do so. But I think that it's important that we remember them and of course, that their legacy lives on. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for this evening and of course, say, you know, that if you have any questions, please do feel free to ask. And thank you very much.